All right, let's get going. It's one o'clock. It's time for another exciting afternoon of organic chemistry, Chem 170, with your host, me, Dr. White. Good news. Do you hear any clicking? That's because I solved the problem, finally. Part of it was, eh, uh, here was the problem. I can't, ah, yes, I can reach it. I've been using for years these USB hubs from, uh, who is it, uh, Sabrent, or Sabrent, however you pronounce it, and they're unpowered, and I've never had a problem. Well, when I had hooked up to this, my mouse, because behind me, about four feet, three feet that way, are my computers. They're not underneath this desk. Uh, I was pulling connected to this, my mouse, two cameras, and my tablet. Well, I was pulling a lot of power, and I'd forgotten there's a limit how much this provides in terms of power, not the data signal, the power. And that affects the whole integrity. My newer webcam needed more power than my old one. That's probably what the clicking was. It was, oh, do I want to work? Do I don't? And it was going nuts. Sorry, webcam. But anyways, it dawned on me Monday after our class. Wait a second. USB ports only give, and this is a long wire that's a special long uh, length amplified uh, USB cord, but any USB port on a computer, the 3.0 is 900 milliamps, my hobby is electronics. And I said, I must be pulling close to that or just about that. And it was also goofing up my computer at times. Well, uh, Monday night, I ordered a um, powered USB port that you have a separate power supply for that. Your data signal is not affected, but it injects power to your device. And guess what? I'm on a better camera. I'm happy. Dr. White has solved the problem. Uh, a couple of life lessons. One, when you have a problem, don't give up and just say, I can't solve it. Uh, I'm one of those, I don't give up. The other thing is don't assume or and think about what's really the base basics. When I finally did, it dawned on me. Mm, it's like plugging too many things into an outlet and the outlet will fail or the circuit breaker will go click. All right, let's get to work. Today, game plan one, I will go through the problem set for chapter two, I guess it's chapter alkanes. And then what I'll do next is we'll finish up the chapter on alkenes and alkynes. Next, we'll have our lab. And if I look at the clock, I have one up here. I also have one down here, smaller one. But anyways, I would venture to guess you'll be out of here by 2.30, if not a little earlier. Yay. Thank you, Dr. White. And in real life, if we were working, I'd spend the first 15 minutes on lecture, take a 10 minute break if we were at ECC. You do the lab, you'd be out by three because you actually have to go in the lab and do it, maybe 3.15, 3.30. But you're welcome. And so let's get to work. Before we do, I don't. I think I mentioned the first day, I have a hearing problem. If we were in class, you'd see my hearing aids. I don't have mine because I have two big amplified speakers up there and I can turn up the volume. However, even with those, one of the hardest things for me to sometimes perceive or figure out is letters of the alphabet. So if you ask, could you please explain 1B? If I ask you, what was that again? Please be patient with me. That's my problem, not yours. It's heredity. Uh, <laughs> I inherited that from my mother who inherited that from her grandfather. My older sister had hearing aids about 20 years before I had to and uh, she got it worse than I do. I only have about a 50% hearing loss. She's got about an 80%. I mean, without her hearing aid, she can't hear you, period. Or just about, unless you scream. So let's get to work. 
And does everybody see chapter two, Al Kane's problem set on the screen? Good. All right. Now, I'm not going to do all these, but if you have a question and want me to do one, ask me. All right. How many carbon atoms are in the longest chain of following? Well, notice Dr. White was nice. I didn't even put in hydrogens so you could just see the chain. And if we notice C, we have one, two, three, four, five across, one, two, three, four. On a PDF file, I can't use my tablet pen. I haven't figured out yet how to do that. And therefore, I'll just have you look at the cursor. And if you want me to do other problems, I can write it on my whiteboard. Now, if we look here, this ND, six across, or one, two, three, four, five, six, either one. There's a third chain I didn't number, one, two, three, four, five. And notice chains like a bicycle chain are not straight when you lay them on the ground unless you make them straight. And if you look at this one, what's the longest chain? Well, it turns out nine. This carbon is connected to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon, linked to this, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Or I could have started up here one. If I go across, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's why it's the longest chain. Now, that's an important skill in order to do the following. Give the IUPAC name for the following molecules, which reminds me, I forgot to ask, did any of you happen to drive by a gas station and think of alkanes? Did you? I see one person. Did you happen to look at a candle and think of can alkanes? Did you use natural gas? cooking or your hot place where you live? Was it nice and warm? And do you think of alkanes, methane, natural? Remember, organic chemistry is all around us and it won't hurt for you to think about it when you leave my class. And that's, I see some people did. So, but we'll learn more about where organic chemistry is everywhere around you. Oh, speaking about everywhere around you, important uh, personal public service announcement. If you haven't seen the next uh, couple of day forecast for the weather, besides tomorrow night, we're supposed to have snow and whatever. It's been changing up and down. I'll probably get to spend some quality time Thursday night with my driveway and snow blower. Why Thursday night? Because Friday morning and Saturday and Sunday, it's going to get super cold. I'd highly recommend fill up your gas tank. And that's something I always do. In the old days, you had to worry about water getting into your gas line freezing up. But since they put ethanol, and I'll talk more about that when we get into alcohols, into gasoline, that keeps water out of your gas line. But still, fill up your tank. It's a good safety thing. All right. Now, if I look at B, give the IUPAC name for the following. And this is called nomenclature. Remember, that's naming. That's the fancy, fancy name for naming. And here we have IUPAC. I'll never ask on a test that stands for International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry, but I will expect you to know that means the official name. And if we look here, what do you have to do? Count the number of carbons in the longest chain. Well, there's only one here and the root name for six, three, six is hexane. Now, when you have an alkyl group, you find the longest chain, like in D, it's four, butane, and then left over is the alkyl groups, and this one, one carbon methyl, and then you look at which carbon it is on, you number by starting from either end, and you number in such a way that the alkyl groups get the lowest number. Starting from this, it would be on carbon two. This end, one, two, three. Two is less than three. Two methyl butane. Now, if you notice, this has the same name. What I really did was rotate it 180 degrees to show you that longest chain four and butane, methyl group left over. Now you start from this side, one, two, 
two methyl butane. And if we look at G, what's the longest chain? One, two, three, four, coming down this way, five, six. If I go all the way across, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's an alkane, nine carbons, no name. I have left over a methyl group, three carbons to the center carbon, isopropyl, four, and therefore it's two methyl, four isopropyl, no name. Now, I follow the IUPAC alphabet rules. I'm not asking you to. So if you would put down four isopropyl, two methyl, no name, I would give that correct. Now for a ring, oops, let's take a look at rings. Ring, you count the number of carbons by each bend in a line, because on a ring we don't show carbons or hydrogens, each bend a line in a carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hexane, it's a ring, cyclohexane. Common mistake on test one, and I've had one student make it, and she lost about, out of 100 points, I think 14 points, which is not good. And when you have a ring, you need to put cyclo, like cyclohexane. If you had just written down hexane, I give you zero points, and students have come, well, shouldn't I get partial credit? I said, no, if I ask draw, a hand and you draw a foot, and you say, well, I had five digits on what I drew. No, it's different. Different as night is day to Dr. White, an organic chemist. Now, when you have only one alkyl group on a ring, no matter what carbon it is, that carbon is always going to be number one. And because everybody knows that, and you do too now, we don't use a number when there's only one alkyl group on a ring. This is isopropyl, six-membered ring, isopropyl cyclohexane. Now here, we have five carbons on a ring, pentane. It's a ring, cyclopentane. And then we have a T-butyl group, one of my favorite, and an ethyl. Now, I have the correct IUPAC. I would accept three other answers on this. I see a question maybe. All right, I'll get back to you, Josh. I'm not sure what you meant by that. But anyways, here, or was to previous something I said. Anyways, T-butyl ethyl. Now, you give the alkyl groups the lowest number, and for IUPAC, the one with the highest alphabetical priority closest to the front, you ignore prefixes. You could also put down here T-butyl, and so B is an E, so this gets to number one. And you number in such a way, clockwise or counterclockwise, that the other alkyl groups get the lowest number. So this is one, this would be on two, one turn, butyl 2 ethyl cyclopentane. Remember the cyclo. Now, if you put the 2 ethyl first and then 1 T -but butyl, I'd mark that correct. If you had got the numbers switch, I'd still mark it right on this problem because you're not going to be organic chemists if you were. I'd mark it wrong, but you're not. And if you got the order and the numbers switch, I'd still give you, and that's why there are four answers for you, but in reality, there's, this is the correct IUPAC answer. Now, there are two questions I can ask in nomenclature on a test. One is give the IUPAC name, and the other is draw the condensed structure for the following names of molecules. A lot of times I won't put IUPAC because I only did one this uh, whole on chapters for test one. But later on, you'll be learning more what we call common names. And how do you do that? Well, you've learned my, not my chart, the chart for 
the carbons one through 10 alkanes and notice octane, eight carbons. You don't have to put the line there. I do so it doesn't droop. And then you put in the hydrogens. Public service announcement from Dr. White. Remember, there are four bonds to carbon. Four bonds to carbon. Didn't know I'm ambidextrous. I can do it even with both hands at the same time. Uh, I am ambidextrous. Uh, I actually learned how to use a bullwhip and crack it with my left hand and arm before I could do it with my right. Don't ask. Same thing with a boomerang. I learned how to throw one and get it come back with my left before I could do it with my right, even though I am right dominant when it comes to writing and everything. Even though when I was younger, I could also write with my left hand, but I haven't practiced that in ages. All right, everything you didn't want to know about Dr. White. And that's how you know how many carbon hydrogens go on a carbon. Here's one carbon, one bond to it, four minus one, the remainder is hydrogen. Now, here we have 2,3-dimethyl, and I forgot the dash there, don't look, dimethyl hexane. And you start from the right and move left, hexane, six carbons. Next, I have di, ooh, that means two, methyl CH3, and there are in carbons two and three. This is one, that's two, that's three. Now for rings, you do the same thing, butane, four, cyclo ring. Yes, we call this a ring, even though other people call it a square, it's a ring. Now I made a mistake in my number here, even Dr. White makes mistakes. And this really should be the name one terpbutyl, two ethyl cyclopentane, but even with this name, you should be able to get it. You start from this end, pentane, five carbons, cyclo, it's a ring. By the way, cyclopentane rings remind me of the greenhouse in Monopoly. And they do. Did I tell you my sister and I cheated each other when one of us would go to the bathroom, the other one would steal from the bank? We played cutthroat Monopoly when we were about six or seven. But anyways, cyclopentane, one carbon has a T-butyl group or tert-butyl, and the other one has this one. Now I did it in a way most of you never did, and let me show you the way, which is also perfectly correct, that most of you did. You'd probably put the T-butyl group on top for carbon one and the ethyl group this way. And there are four bonds to carbon. And there you go. And sometimes I'll be, when I've made the keys, I'm in a, how should I say, this funky mood, and I'll write it and I think about, oh, they're going to get confused. So sorry about that. All right. And propane. How many of you remember propane? That's the stuff in the white canister that powers your, uh, uh, provides the fuel for your plane for your barbecue. Now, the following on test I'll have give the reaction product or products or following reaction. Remember, we don't burn, uh, burn. we don't balance uh, chemical equations in organic chemistry, unless you have to. In my class, you'd never want to have to. Now, if we look at this, what do we have? Oh, we have propane oxygen. And let me show you how to do that in case you forgot. And the question is, what are the products you get? What's this? It's an alkane. But it could have also been a cycloalkane. And you're reacting with oxygen. You need a spark or heat source. And what you get is combustion. You get CO2 plus water. Or if you could have wanted to, you can put the water first order, which goes first or second, doesn't matter. And you get heat, but that's not a 
product in terms of a chemical product. Therefore, any alkane you react with oxygen, you'll get CO2 plus water. And that would be the correct answer. And as I've mentioned, I'll mention again, this is a general reaction. You should be learning these. Write it down five times and say it. Whenever you have an alkane or cycloalkane, oxygen, you get CO2 and water. If you notice, the rest of them, same answer. This is octane. I wrote it this way just to show you, but on a test, until we get the fats and oils, I won't use parentheses. And therefore, oxygen, alkane, CO2, and water. Cyclohexane, a ring, cycloalkane, oxygen, you get CO2 and water. And that's problem set for alkanes. Any questions? Remember, I haven't said this in a while, there's no such thing ever, ever in my life as a dumb question. Okay, we did our first problem set. And that's how I do problem sets. Later on, you'll see the other chapters have longer problem sets, some of them up to 12 pages. Relax, you'll do them, you'll get them. They're not that hard, I hope, no. Uh, speaking about that hard, remember tonight and also on Monday, I will have my office hour. If you have any questions, come on by and say hello. How's my better camera looking? Good, right? Thank you. I am so happy I finally solved that. All right, let me just clean up. Okay, everybody see additional water to an alkene on your screen? Good, thank you. All right, this is a reaction I was showing you on uh, Monday, and let's take a look at it. The general reaction is if you have a double bond and you react it with, and usually historically chemists do it this way, H plus and water. Remember, this is a catalyst, acid catalyst. Well, most of your enzymes are acid catalysts too, which provide H plus. And usually it's something like sulfuric acid. And water, remember, I can write it as HOH, where OH is a hydroxyl group. And double bond, one pi bond one sigma bond. You break pi bonds, you break sigma or single bonds. Time for another public. No, you'd never do that, except in combustion, and another reaction that I'm not teaching you. It never, almost never, ever happens. Therefore, let's go back. You break the pi bond, that's why there's only one line and one carbon gets the H from water. The other gets the OH from water, hydroxyl group. And this follows Markovnikov's rule. And that is the carbon of the double bond that has the most hydrogens gets this hydrogen and the other carbon gets the hydroxyl group. And I went through some examples. So it's time for Dr. White to share the fun. And the question would be, give the organic product for the following. So have some fun, your turn.
And for those who are quicker than others, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. When you look at an organic molecule, you should look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond? What's not carbon or hydrogen? Oh, look, it's a double bond. And immediately in my mind, I look at the rest of the molecule, see nothing else different. And therefore, I think about double bond reacting with acid and water. H plus is acid. I know water I can think of as HOH. I break the pi bond because it says one pi bond and one sigma bond. And one carbon gets H, the other gets the hydroxyl group OH and it follows Markovnikov's rule. And what is that? The carbon with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen, the other carbon gets the hydroxyl group. Or as I was taught, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We're talking about hydrogens. And if we look at this carbon, it has one hydrogen. If we look at this carbon, it has none. Which is the greater number, one or zero? And eh, hopefully you pick that. Now you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. So I have three, four carbons across this carbon up here. Here are my two carbons of the double bond. This one will get the hydrogen. This gets the hydroxyl group. And I know there are four bonds to carbon and I can put in my hydrogens. Now, if you wanted to write that as CH2, that's okay, leave it like this. That's fine, it's one less step for you to get wrong on the test. And that's how you do, oh, let's do one more. These are fun. And here's one more for you to have fun with. What would be the organic product or products for the following three points each? Hint. Some of you look like you're getting the hang of this pretty good. Aren't you proud of yourself? Isn't it fun when you're succeeding? <laughs> profound. Yes, Dr. White, profound. But people forget that. Look, I'm doing something new and I'm doing it right. You should be proud of yourself. I am. And when you're done, don't forget, give me a thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do it. We look at this molecule. Oh, I've got a ring. But that's just carbon, carbon, single bonds, and hydrogens, carbons. Same thing with these alcohol groups. Oh, I have a double bond. And the only thing of interest here is the double bond, H plus, acid, and water. And remember, Water is HOH, OH hydroxyl group. I break the pi bond. One carbon gets H. The other carbon double bond gets OH. And it follows Markovnikov's rule. And that is the carbon with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen from water. And the other carbon gets the hydrogen. Oh, it's a ring. Now I got to do some heavy duty math. This carbon. How many hydrogens? We don't show it, but there's one there. One, two, three bonds, four minus three. Why? Because there's four bonds to carbon always is one. 
So this carbon has one. We look at this carbon, I have one, two, three, four. Four minus four equals zero. So if we look at the two carbons, which has more? This one. So the hydrogen will go here and the hydroxyl group OH will go there. Do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. I have my ring. I have my ethyl group. I have a methyl over here. Methyl. This carbon doesn't get anything more. This carbon is this carbon right there. And that gets the hydroxyl group. Now, if you put this over there and this down here like this, It's the same thing all I've done is rotate it this way, 180 degrees, and they're identical. Because as I mentioned before, and students forget, on a piece of paper, it looks like it's glued. But if I said, oh, look, my right hand, close your eyes, and I did this, oh, look, something different. No, you just rotate it, well, molecules rotate. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about alkynes. We've already done the nomenclature, but just to remind you, it's an acyclic unsaturated hydrocarbon. That means not in a ring, has only carbon hydrogens. In this case, the unsaturation means it has one or more carbon-carbon triple bond. And triple bond is linear to bond angle like this. And you have two pi bonds and one sigma bond. And pi bonds I can break easy, sigma bonds I can't. And we went through the alkyne, uh, alkyne nomenclature. You name as the longest chain with the triple bond, both carbons is an alkane. Drop the A-N-E ending, put Y-N-E, there's no cis-trans isomerism of triple bonds. Oops. Warning, organic chemists are lazy. We are. And when we can be lazy and not have to do extra stuff, we take the shortcut always. And you're going to learn one right now. Let's talk about the reaction of hydrogen with a triple bond. And here are means carbon hydrogens. That means any molecule with a triple bond in it, if I hydrogenate it, add hydrogen, and I use a catalyst, I'll break the pi bonds. Now, let's take a look at the triple bond again. It has two pi bonds, not unlike a double bond, which has one pi bond. Now, organic chemists, well, if you have two pi bonds, you need two moles or two molecules of hydrogen gas. We're lazy. I don't want to write a two there. What if I had more than that? So I'll put this, then I'll do bracket, X, S, close bracket. And this X, S in a bracket means I've got all the hydrogen in the world to react with anything I react with. That's shorthand for excess. Aren't we neat and lazy? And here you still have the catalyst. Remember, the catalyst is something that makes the reaction go quicker, is not consumed in the reaction. Platinum, palladium, or nickel. And because you have two pi bonds, each time you break a pi bond with hydrogenation, each carbon of the triple bond gets a hydrogen two pi bonds, each one gets two hydrogens. And that's hydrogenation. Now, if we come over here,
if I were to ask you, give the organic product or products or the following, what do you do? Well, you look at the molecule and say, what's different? What's well, not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon-hydrogen atoms? Oh, look, a triple bond. Three lines gives it away. Three, triple, like in third base in baseball. I'm reacting it with excess hydrogen. That means I have all the hydrogen world that will react with anything that can react with hydrogen. I have a catalyst nickel. Remember your catalysts are nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break not the one, remember this has two pi bonds and a sigma bond. I'll break the two pi bonds and each carbon gets two hydrogens, which you could also write like this. I, either way works for me. So do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No, you have one, two, three, four carbons across. Better end up with four carbons across. Each of the two carbons of the triple bond gets not one, but two hydrogens because you broke two pi bonds. And then I fill in the rest of the hydrogens. You wanted to make these two, instead of showing expanded CH2, CH2, that's fine. And that's how you do it. And why don't you have some fun? Give the organic product or products for the following reaction. Psst, you're doing organic chemistry. Hopefully it's not too hard. And when you're done, don't forget, thumbs up. If I were in a classroom, I could look around, see if everybody, but not all of you have your video your cameras on. If you want to turn them on, feel free to, so I can see your pretty faces. You already see mine. All right, I think everybody's done. Question is three points. If I were to put this on a test, give, and when I say give, I mean draw. So we look at this molecule, look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond, carbon or hydrogen, and we look here at triple bond. What am I reacting with? Hydrogen. Oh, look, excess. That means you have all the hydrogen in the world that will react with anything hydrogen can react with. And platinum is a catalyst. You break the two pi bonds and each carbon of the triple bond gets not one, but two hydrogens. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So I have one, two, three, four across. I have a methyl group on this carbon. Here are my two carbons of the triple bond. I've broken both pi bonds and each one gets two hydrogens. And this one already had a hydrogen, so I'll put it in. And then the rest of them, I know there's four bonds of carbon. And that's your product. Oh, let's do one more.
And there you go. Give the organic product your product for the following. Let me clean something up. Now that looks nicer. I feel better. I think everybody's just about done. Give you a couple more seconds to finish up. All right, anybody need more time? Going once, going twice. All right, let's do this. But first, before I do this, uh, it's time for Dr. White public service announcement. Look at this. I just asked you give the organic product or products for the following. Three months ago, would you even know what I was talking about? Would you even know what to look at when you're looking at this? Oh, it's some lines and letters of the alphabet. What do I do? No, you've learned. Think about it. How much have you learned in our short time together? Doesn't that feel good? I hope you said yes. All right, let's do this. What's different? What's not a carbon carbon single bond? or a carbon or hydrogen atom and triple bond. Reacting it with hydrogen excess. That's what that means. You have all the hydrogen world and this is a catalyst. And the catalyst can be in this case, palladium, platinum or nickel. And you break the two pi bonds And do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. So I'm still going to have my ring of a methyl group. I have my two carbons of what was a triple bond. I still have this carbon here. And then each one of these gets not one, but two hydrogens. If you instead here, you wanted to write CH2. And same thing over there. That's okay. And that's how you do hydrogenation of a triple bond. Now you can also halogenate a triple bond, alkyne. And here, remember, X is the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. If you have any triple bond, if you react a with a halogen gas, but remember we have two pi bonds, so we need more than one molecule of halogen and organic chemists are lazy and we use excess. And that means you have all the halogen in the world that can react with a halogen gas and each pi bond, each atom of the triple bond gets a halogen, there are two of them, you get two. So this is halogenation of an alkyne. It's a way of making a poly, meaning many halogenated compound. And if I were to take bromine gas, Br2, excess, and react it with this molecule, what would be the organic product or products? I look to see what's different. I'll double, triple bond. 
almost a double bond. I actually, I did. And reacting with, oh, bromine is a halogen. We have excess. Remember, this can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you break the two pi bonds, and each one gets a, two halogens. And therefore, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. Since you don't break carbon carbon single bonds, I'm still going to have five carbons. Now, this is important. Only the carbons of the triple bond get the halogen. You put them on other ones, I mark it wrong. And the halogen was bromine. And that's how you do it. Your turn. All right, I think everybody's almost done. Remember, give me a thumbs up to help me out so I know you're done. Thank you, Cynthia. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do it. What do we see that's different here? What's well, not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen, triple bond. What am I reacting with? Ooh, chlorine gas, that's a halogen. I have excess, which means I have all the halogen in the world that will react with halogen. For this reaction, X can be the halogens fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And here, you break the pi bond, and each carbon of the triple bond now has two halogens. Therefore, did I break? Ooh, I forgot a hydrogen there. Somebody should have caught that. I did, luckily. Uh, to break carbon carbon single bonds, no. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven across. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven across. On this carbon, I have a methyl group. And these are these two carbons. I broke the two pi bonds, and each one gets not one, but two chlorines. Halogen counts as one bond. Two of them count as two bonds. And that's how you do it. Now, if I look at the clock, it's time for our break. I'm going to take a five minute stretch break. I'll see you back in five minutes and we'll be doing our lab, our first lab of the semester. Okay. I'll see you in five at 155.
If you look at my picture on there, that's the condenser I used in grad school, not the exact one. I'll talk more about condensers later in the semester.
All right, everybody, time to start again. Ring, ring. Get you all back to class. Oh, I forgot to mention yesterday, and I think I already mentioned it's going to get cold, but I made my, I usually I only go four or five times a year because it's dangerous. Went to Costco to stock up on stuff and I dropped about 350. But I stock up on a lot of stuff, which is why I only go there once in a while. Uh, my best friend who lives in Indiana, it's like a supermarket, but where I live, Joshua, understand, go right ahead. Uh, he goes every week, but I just get some of the basic things like vegetable oil, uh, bag, Ziploc baggies. They have good deals on it, always cheapest place around, a whole bunch of stuff. Before you know it, $350, wow. But I only go a couple times a year. All right, it's time for a lab. If we were at COD, I uh, see wrong school, ECC, we'd be in the lab. And I just take this time, just like I'm going to do now, explaining what you're going to do. And then I let you go in the lab and you do it and get data. Obviously, we're not in the lab and you can't do organic chemistry at home safely. So you're not. And also because uh, I personally didn't feel safe going to ECC to doing just a couple labs because what they've done is uh, for the other classes, they split them in half. So you have only a few people at a time in the lab so you can have social distancing. Well, that means they do half as many labs, but I'll still give you the same experience other than you're not gonna be actually manipulating it. All right, every lab is in the assignment area or will be a couple of days, a day or two before I will post it in the assignment area of Blackboard. And if you look today, there is the melting point lab there. You don't have to download it now, but you will have to somehow either read it and look at it and know what to do. If you don't have a printer, the parts where you're answering questions, just write the question number and write your answer. You don't have to rewrite the whole question. Same thing when you do tests later on, I'll tell you this and upload it as a PDF file. All labs, as I mentioned, are due next, the following lab period. Our labs are worth 11 points each and they're easy points. So if you don't hand them in, you get zero points. If you hand them in late, uh, I'll take off points or if it's more than a couple of days late, you get zero points. So please do have them handed in on time. They're always due like today's lab will be due next Wednesday by two or three and I'll give you a day or two more in case some emergency comes in. All right, let's look at today's lab. And today's lab deals with melting points. And hopefully everybody sees melting points on your screen. This is what you download. And melting points, and I'm not gonna read over all this, is an important uh, physical Con, uh, parameter or property, that's the word I was looking for, that you measure for all chemicals, but it's very important for organic chemicals. And melting points for organic chemicals usually have a range of zero to 300 or less than 300 degrees C, Celsius. In the lab, we always measure melting point in Celsius. Hopefully everybody sees the melt, the whiteboard on there. Since nobody's screaming at me, I assume you do. Now, why do you take melting points? Well, there are two reasons. One is for ID identification. It helps you identify a compound. And the other is to determine Purity. So melting point can help you identify a compound, organic compound, and also melting points will help 
identify purity. Do you want to take medicine that has, or other things you buy that are organic molecules with other garbage in there? I sure don't. And that's where melting points have that come in. Now, what is a melting point? That's when a solid changes its physical state and becomes a liquid. So when something melts, I think you've all seen ice cubes in a glass melt and become a water as a liquid. Well, when you heat something at a certain temperature, it becomes a liquid. Now in organic chemistry, melting points are ranges. And what we do is we have a start and a finish for your melting point. What's the starting melting point or temperature? That's when you see any liquid in your sample. And finishes when Oh, don't forget, there's no such thing as a dumb question. If you can't read my handwriting, a good question is, what did you write there? Hopefully I'm doing it, I'm printing instead of writing it out, and make it easier. So if I had compound, oh, I'm gonna be compound Z, and I took the melting point, I might see a melting point. By the way, I'll do this. Eh. This is abbreviation for melting point of say 75, to 77 degrees C. And that would be the melting point of compound Z, whatever it is. And we do melting points. Now let's take a look at up here, the start and finish. Because you look for when you see any liquid in your sample, you'll call that the start. In this case, it would have been 75. And the finish is when all your samples liquid. Therefore, it's very important to try and do the minimal amount of sample, because if you have way too much, it's going to take more time and higher temperature to melt all of it, and you're not going to get a valid melting point. So sample size is important. Now, I need to teach you about something that you might have learned in general chemistry called the colligative effect. And the colligative effect is when you mix two different things together, its physical properties will change. Example would be when you mix two solids together that are different and there's a colligative effect, the melting point gets lower, is depressed, and gets wider. And that's very true in organic chemistry. Now, as you know, it's going to get cold in a couple of days. And if there was ice on your sidewalk or driveway and it was super cold, you either would put rock salt on there, sodium chloride, or better one or those little white pellets, calcium chloride. And you put it on there and it's like five below zero Fahrenheit and the mel ice is melting. How does that do that? Well, the calcium chloride react with the ice to form a colligative property and it lowers the melting point. So it melts at a much colder temperature than water, obviously known as ice melts, this is zero degrees C, 32F. And that's how it works. Well, the same thing happens with organic chemistry. And it's time for Dr. White to spell colligative wrong. 
Maybe not. Did I tell you I was always the first one down in a spelling bee? I was. Thank goodness for spell check, even though on a whiteboard or a table like this, there's no spell check. All right. It could be two or more, but for here, let's just say two chemicals. And what you see is the melting point is lower and wider. So if I had two compounds, let's be X and Y, and both had the same melting point. And let's say they were 100 to 102 degrees C. And sometimes that will happen. Two different compounds have the same melting point. If I were to take a sample of X and Y, the melting point might be 90 to 99 degrees C, or it might even be lower. Notice this is now wider and lower. And that's the colligative effect. Now, it turns out this is useful. Colligative effect tells you if you have a compound X that's supposed to be pure, and there's some Y impurity in there, you won't get the correct melting point. It will be lower and wider. Now, the other thing is, let's assume you have two samples, A and B, and they both have the same melting point. Or, um, I'm getting this wrong, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Eh. You have a sample A as a melting point, say 74 to 76. And you think A is, I don't know, um, I'm thinking of a good solid. Urea actually has, and you think it's urea. If you take a mixture Fifty fifty mixture by way of A and urea. If A was urea, you should get about the same melting point. If A was something different, then you might get a melting point like 60 to 68. And that tells you A, if it's the same melting point was urea, if it's lower and wider, it's not urea. And this is the other thing that uh, you can use melting points for. For identity, you can mix two things together, not knowing just alone the melting point, and it will show you that if I mix something unknown with something known and the same melting point, guess what? They're the same thing. If I mix things that are not the same, you won't get the same melting point, and that also shows you purity. If you have other things in your sample or what you made, your melting point will be lower and wider because of the colligative effect. And one of the nice things about this lab and the others is 
Science is based on when you go into the lab and find data, facts. And this semester, uh, I think somebody might have a question. I'll get to you in a second. And this semester, you'll find out, am I lying to you about this? If we had been in the lab, we would be doing that. Martin, do you have a question? All right, is your microphone's on? Let me shut it off. I just shut it off. And don't get scared if I ask, do you have a question? It's allowed. All right, before we go into what you're actually doing today, let me play a short video for you. Yeah, I can do this. Everybody see on your screen melting point? One of the physical properties of a pure organic solid is its melting point. And we're going to demonstrate how we take a melting point. The apparatus that we're going to use is called a melt pit. Now, this is an older version of the, this the kind we use at COD, ACC. Constructed with a variac and a heated aluminum block, which has a place for a thermometer, the samples, and a magnifying glass to see what happens as the solid starts to melt. There's also a lamp here which illuminates the sample. Now there's a newer version of the melt pen. And the only difference between it and the older version is the shield because the uh, aluminum block gets very, very hot and so does the lamp. And so in order to avoid getting burned, the manufacturer has constructed the shield around the place where the melting point actually occurs. But we're not going to use this one, although we do have it in the laboratory. We're going to use the older version. The first thing we have to do is to get a sample. The sample that I'm going to take a melting point of is the compound fluorinone. Now fluorinone is a naturally yellow material and we chose this so that we could see when the melting uh, point phenomenon actually occurs in the sample tube which we're going to take the melting point in. What we do is we fill up A, a glass tube which is sealed at only one end. It has an open end as well. And that's how we're going to get the compound. In. And the way we do this is to take the solid, take the open end of the melting point capillary and poke it in there a few times to get about maybe five to 10 millimeters length of solid in the tube. Observe the solid in the tube. Now the trick is to get that solid from the open end to the closed end. And the way we do that is to simply tap, tap the solid down by hitting the closed end against a against the, the desktop, if you will. The solid is now down at the closed end. All right, we're ready to take the melting point now. Plug in our apparatus. And you can tell that the instrument is working because when you uh, turn this on, the, the light goes on in there. Okay. 
we're going to use the thermometer that's supplied with your kit of equipment. And it's going to go into the thermometer section of the heated aluminum block. Now we have to remember that the thermometer fits very, very tightly into the aluminum block. If there is any amount of catch that this thermometer experiences as you push it down in there, do not use it. Withdraw it immediately because this thermometer will get stuck in there and you'll never get it out, believe me. Now we also want to put into the aluminum block where the sample is being held, right there. There are two diagrams in your laboratory manual, which I want you to pay attention to, concerning the use of the uh, variac on the melt temp. It's important to understand that the setting on the variac is going to determine the maximum temperature, as well as the time it takes to get to that maximum temperature in the aluminum block, so that we're going to set the variac at a proper rise in temperature versus the amount of time we feel is necessary to get a good melting point of this solid. And that's something that you're going to have to get used to and incorporate into your laboratory procedure. <laughs> that music is, but you, I'll do the commentary. If you look in there, you'll see it's heating up acetyl liquid in there. That's the start. And you look at the thermometer. And then when it's all liquid, that's the finish. And I think it's about all liquid. I don't know why that Oh, they do get that music. All right. Well, let me turn me back on again. All right. In uh, ECC, we use that same type. And I'd be warning you, the lamp gets hot. And the little block has like a heating unit in there, like a hot plate, and it gets hot enough to burn yourself. Now, a number of years ago, about four years, five years ago, we stopped using thermometers and we used the thermal couple in there to meter. But it's just measuring the temperature and it's more easier, accurate way of doing that. Now, if we were in the uh, lab, I would have shown you how to tap that tube down, melting point capillary tube solid at one other end. Now, you don't want to fill it up too much because it takes more temperature energy. You won't get a good melting point. Same thing as the knob on there that controls how fast it heats up. If we're, it goes from zero to 100, which doesn't pertain to the temperature, but how fast it heats up. For our labs, I usually tell students set it at 40, 45, that's a good rate, not too fast, no, it's not too slow. Oh, it sounds like Goldilocks. But anyways, and that gets you to a good temperature. And you would be going in and then having fun doing melting points. But because we don't, I've helped you out. Let me just do one thing. I guess it doesn't want me to do one. Hold on. There we are. Uh, that's not what I want. Ah. All right, does everybody see melting point on your screen now? Okay. Now, 
here's how if you were, and we don't have to pulverize it because we're in the lab, Dr. Daly, who runs the lab for us, he's also teaches the two semester organic. And if we were in the lab, I'd be telling you what a wonderful job he did. All our samples are already pulverized. And you'd fill it in, uh, you'd heat the sample at a slow rate, and you record the first temperature as your start, when you see any liquid, when your uh, entire sample is. Now I'd be teaching a trip how to use an airline to cool it down quicker. We also have newer digital ones that until this last spring, uh, we hadn't bought the equipment to cool them down quicker, so I had to use them in my lab. Now, if we were in the lab, you'd actually be doing this yourself, biphenyl, benzoic acid, and urea, and you'd be getting the melting points. Now, these are theoretical. Uh, you wouldn't get them as close to that, or they're close to theoretical, because you've never done them. Dr. White, I've lost, I've lost count how many I've done in my life, but it's over a couple thousand. Uh, when I was in grad school, and I did a lot of them. And now, notice urea and a compound called transdynamic acid have the same melting point. And in the lab, you would have done a 50-50 mixture. And notice, oh, look what happened. It's lower and wider. And that's because of the colligative effect. It's true, it really does happen. And that's the sad part about it, this virtual lab, you don't get to do it. Now, to make it interesting, you would have an unknown there and do it. And you'd get a melting point. And then I'd tell you the unknown is one of these samples up here. And you would have to take some of the unknown, A in this case, and one of those samples, mix them together and determine the melting point. And if you got the, about the same melting point as when you did A alone, you've now identified it. And for this lab, here's the melting point of the unknown. Here's it with benzoic acid. Here's it with synamic acid or transdynamic, I really should have there. And you've got to identify it from what you learned today and table uh, down here, table one, which gives you, these are called literature values. And then over here are a bunch of questions to answer. And that's today's lab. And usually about now, it's about how long I take, I'd say you got going to lab and you have until 10 to four to finish doing those melting points. And most of you would be done by 3.15. Well, we're not doing that. We're done for today. Remember next Wednesday, this is due to be uploaded as a PDF file in my um, D2 on D2L. I have filed how to upload stuff, make a PDF file if you don't have a scanner with your smartphone. Has anybody ever found a dumb phone? But anyways, uh, I keep on saying that. I should just say cell phone. And I think you all have access if you don't have your own, but I think most of you do, I like all of you, but maybe not. You have access to one and you can use uh, cam scanner as one. Uh, someone at the other school yesterday, um, Monday brought up one, I'll have to ask again, another app that does the same thing. Or I also show you how you can do it, manipulating P, uh, JPEG files to do that. And that's it, I'm done. Uh, remember, practice, start doing some of the practice problems on alkenes and alkynes. We're almost done with the chapter. And with that, I'm going to stick around for a couple minutes, but I'm going to say, first of all, don't forget tonight, I have my office hour in 15 minutes on the other Zoom uh, address or login, and feel free to come by if you have any questions whatsoever. And if not, I'm going to say, gang gazun, be healthy. Also, stay warm. It's going to get real cold out there. And you have a nice rest of the weekend, weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Goodbye. Gain the sun, stay healthy, bye.